Welcome to an EDB special report on its attempts to land a Kerbal on the moon and return that Kerbal safely back to the Earth. Unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, we will not have in-program audio for the video, for most of the video, and that is because this is actually the backup copy, a uh, issue occurred with the main copy. This launch is of the Hercules transfer stage by Shirstrut Industries on an Aphrodite rocket by Cool Industries Rockets. And this uh, launch sequence, this attempt at a lunar landing will be the one from Schustrat Industries and therefore the EDB's own spacecraft, uh, but launched on a contractor rockets. And so we have booster separation. The deadline for the contract to get a Kerbal on the moon and return that Kerbal safely was uh, coming close to its conclusion. And so the EDB decided to go with its own designs, having had issues with uh, contractor designs in previous occasions. However, with even one engine failure on these launches, it's a sequence of two launches, uh, the Kerbal would not be going to the moon. We would have to, if it was on the crewed launch, we would have to abort that launch. If uh, it is on this launch with the Hercules stage, we would simply have to uh, launch a new Hercules. But in any case, here we have the Hercules separated, and it will finish up its orbit with its own RD-58 engines, each with four ignitions, lots of delta-V since it is not hauling the craft uh, miracle pod, which it will push to the moon. It will not be responsible for the entire translunar injection, but it is in space and ready for the craft miracle pod. And this is the craft miracle pod H, heavy, because it has more fuel in its own RD-58 stage and we will see how that works out uh, later on. But here is the launch with Jebediah Kerman. Apologies for the EDB website fun bar at the bottom. Uh, during the actual launch, we were attempting to fund the EDB website, uh, elegantdesignbureau.com, and so that's what that was all about. And we have booster separation. Uh, this launcher is the Vesta 2 from Satellite 999 of Satellites R Us. And there is the first stage. First stage set. And second stage ignition. Once the Craft Miracle Pod gets to orbit, it'll be the Hercules' responsibility to rendezvous with it. After all, without the load of the Craft Miracle Pod, the Hercules has a lot of Delta V in its RD-58 engines and four ignitions to work with. Uh, it only needs one ignition to then help with the transfer to the moon. And so it has uh, two more ignitions uh, to make the transfer. Also, it has four one kilonewton thrusters, and those have about 200 meters per second of delta V, and those will probably be used to match velocities with the Kraft Miracle Pod. And so here we are, close to orbit again. Uh, the final stage there will descend, and here we have the two RD-58 engines ready to complete orbit. There we go, ignition. And so we are trying not to leave uh, too much space junk. We will be leaving some space junk that is unavoidable. But here we are ready to go for rendezvous. So back at the Hercules, uh, we have those two RD-58s. And here I'm turning off the one kilonewton thrusters for now because we've got a larger burn to do. This is to match inclinations. Still need to work on that. Again, it's not the launch script's fault. It's getting it to the right inclination technically, but it is a matter of launch window timing. With that timing off, we had a two degree relative inclination with respect to the target after launch, and that's not good. We would like uh, one degree or less, and preferably be spot on. That would be the most ideal situation. But in any case, there was enough delta V to make the necessary corrections, and here the one kilonewton thrusters are matching our velocity with the target. You can see though, they're not that powerful with such a heavy payload. And uh, here we are lined up for docking. And so nearing the target, uh, using propellant only docking ports here, and making fine adjustments, slowing down. You can see that on the Craft Miracle Pod side, its own RD-58 stage is uh, close to the size of the Hercules itself. And so it has quite a lot of Delta V to work with. And in fact, the Hercules is not going to be solely responsible for the translunar injection. We will finish the translunar injection with the RD-58s on the Craft Miracle pod. And so it's going to be a shared responsibility for that transfer. Okay, we are all connected. And so we plot for the moon. 
And once we have our plot, the Hercules begins the transfer and it has, as you can see up there, about 1,800, 1,900 meters per second. So we'll need 1,000, well, let's say 1,400, maybe 1,300 from the RD-58s on the Craft Miracle pod side. And there we go, 1,326 meters per second, it looks like. And then it's also going to need to get us into orbit around the moon. That's 800 meters per second. And then begin our descent. Uh, that'll be on the order of about 1,600 to 2,000 meters per second. And so it's got quite a lot of delta V. It's got uh, more than 4,000 meters per second. And that's because, of course, all it's pushing is the Craft Miracle pod, which will do the final bit of the landing on the moon and then uh, take off and then return back to the Earth, which is on its own also quite a lot of delta V. But here we have to turn around and replot because now things have been altered. And there you see us refining our plot and using the RD-58s on the Craft Miracle pod side to complete this burn. It's slow going though. It doesn't have that much acceleration. And there we have our encounter with the moon, finally. Making final adjustments with RCS. So to complete transfer, we used one ignition of the RD-58 engines, and they have four ignitions. And then to make orbit, we use another ignition. The RD-58 engines have a burn time limit of 10 minutes. And so that's really good. You can pack a lot of Delta V in. Unlike the predecessor one, the unupgraded version of this particular engine is the S1.5400, and that only had a burn time limit of four minutes. So you couldn't really get enough Delta V out of it. You got a lot of thrust weight ratio instead. So not only can the engines be used to finish the transfer to the moon, but also get us into orbit. And what they're doing now is doing the main descent burn. So we're going to burn off all of our horizontal velocity with them and also hopefully be descending enough so that we only have a little bit of vertical velocity left by the time we uh, need to switch to the next stage. The next stage, of course, completes the descent and then gets it back into orbit and then returns it back to the Earth. So it has a lot to do as well. So the key here is, oh, we have a little bit of a orientation issue, but after gaining control again, we separate off the RD-58 stage, and now we are on the final descent burn, and this is basically just straight up and down. We've killed most of the horizontal velocity, but we would like to do that as close to the surface as possible without it being dangerous. Though in this case, with only less than a kilometer left to go before landing, one of our Astros engines decided to have a performance loss issue, uh, causing an uncontrollable spin, and there was really no particular way to recover from this. Uh, we couldn't abort to orbit, we tried, and... Well, we decided to rule that a simulation. Um, that was just not fair. Uh, the EDB was not used to the idea of the Astros engines being under test flight control. Uh, they used to be such reliable engines. Anyway, Ignore what you just saw, we pick it up from the descent burn, and this time uh, with that practice round, we do have it a little bit more optimized, a little bit closer to the surface when we separate off the RD-58s. And so that's a little bit better for us, though there was no particular Delta V issue uh, with the previous version of this. And so here we are again with two Astros engines. You'll note we don't have proper landing struts unlocked yet. Uh, apparently this is high technology and difficult to unlock. So instead, uh, we have this very slim base. It's not the tallest pod I've ever landed on the moon, but unfortunately we appear to have a slope below us. I tried to get rid of as much horizontal speed as possible. You can see that's fairly moderated and I used RCS to do that. But nevertheless, uh, the slope combined with uh, slightly high impact speed, and I guess you can see what, what, what's going to happen here. Alas, um, what has happened to the EDB many times before uh, in, in previous iterations of various landings. And trying to be careful here, but... Ah, uh, yes. The horizontalization of the pod. Well, this was obviously an emergency situation, and EDB brought in all of its contractors to consult with this situation and figure out what was the most uh, logical plan to save 
uh, Jebediah Kerman. Meanwhile, Jeb proceeded with his EVA and uh, set the flag on the surface, indicating his successful landing. Uh, not necessarily return yet, but uh, certainly he is on the surface of the moon. It's just uh, returning the Kerbal back home safely thing. Uh, Jeb attempted various maneuvers to try and see if he could get some leverage on his pod. At least turn it uh, so that it was facing uphill rather than downhill, but ended up breaking some solar panels instead. And so after consultation with the contractors, it was decided that the most logical thing to do was to, uh, well, uh, send over a graviton beam to, to uh, temporarily negate the effects of gravity on the pod? Something like that. But once again, uh, not the most satisfactory uh, solution to our moon mission. While we will demonstrate with the completion of this mission that it is possible to launch a Kerbal or human, a single Kerbal or human, to the moon, with uh, two 800-ton rocket launches uh, without any cryogenic fuels, without the hydrogen-oxygen mix available. Uh, clearly, there are some dangers, and we have had to uh, work around those dangers. In particular, the test flight killing one of the engines on touchdown, and uh, this little pod issue. Obviously, NASA would not have had this problem, though they obviously had a wider launch, uh, wider lander base. Um, I suppose we could have made this uh, lander base wider. It was possible in retrospect, though this was actually the stoutest of the lander options out of all the contractors. So uh, sending hack gravity back up, but I couldn't quite get to one before the pod started to tip over. You could see the nav ball, so I had to quickly ignite the engines and just barely save it from utter disaster. And then uh, quickly uh, go back to the uh, cheap menu screen. We added a 0.97 there. We needed it back to 1.0. Actually, I could have just ticked uh, uh, hack gravity off. Well, actually reset and then tick hack gravity off. Yeah, there we go. All back to normal. In any case, uh, Delta V uh, should have been a fine situation. We did lose some solar panels along the way. So extend all and we see that we only have two solar panels left. But it turns out that that's enough uh, electric charge margin. We we had uh, we had more solar panel re than we strictly needed for this mission, so it's good. We had some redundancy for once, and here we are making orbit around the moon. In general, it takes the same amount of delta v to break orbit around something as it takes to make orbit around something, and so we were expecting about 800 meters per second of delta v to get back home. Uh, it turned out it was a little bit more than that, uh, 900 meters per second, and that's because uh, we were inclined in an inclined orbit, and it was a little bit awkward as far as the timing of our turn trajectory. And here we had discovered the problem with the in-program recording, and so we were able to restart the recording, and now we have in-program audio. Our trajectory ended up being uh, very awkward indeed, and that again is because of the particular orientation of our orbit. And the problem was that it was going to take too long, we were on the wrong side of apoapsis. And so we had to make a correction burn in, uh, in Earth SOI technically, outside of Lunar SOI. And that correction burn managed to bring our orbit a little bit tighter so it would not take so long to reach Earth and of course Jeb's oxygen, water, and food supplies would remain intact. You can see with just 70 odd meters per second left we dump the service module. So fuel margins were okay. Um, the return trajectory from the moon could have been done better in order to save some there. And then we hit the atmosphere, and, uh, well, frankly, there was a glitch. Um, we've brought this pod back before from the moon, and it should not have had this problem. And so we had to restart the program and try it again. And it turned out that this time after a restart, it uh, went into the atmosphere just fine. So if you do have pods randomly exploding when they're not supposed to, uh, even though they have a proper heat shield and everything, Maybe restart the program. That is uh, my, 
my suggestion there, especially if you've been running the program for quite a while. After consultation with contractors, we decided not to use descent mode on the pod and uh, to use a periapsis, approach periapsis of 61 kilometers, and that turned out to be just fine for bringing Jeb down on one pass. It did end up uh, resulting in a slight bounce, but not outside of the atmosphere. So it, uh, the pod remained in the atmosphere throughout the re-entry pass, and Jeb was returned safely back to the surface of the Earth in an ocean landing. So, uh, the EDB did manage to land a Kerbal on the moon, uh, with a asterisk, and return the Kerbal safely back to the Earth with another asterisk. Uh, but we will move on temporarily to other missions, interplanetary exploration and probes, and we will return to the moon at some later date. With that, thank you for watching this special presentation of the EDB Space Program.